Good evening and welcome to Tata Literature Live, the 11th annual Mumbai International Literature Festival and the first one to be completely digital. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors, Tata Steel and Tata Projects. You know, I'm here because I won the birth lottery. The kind of schools I went to, the sort of education I had, my large airy homes, my internet connections, my big beautiful eyes, None of this has anything to do with me or what I did. Yet I get praise for them and for the ripples and consequences of these happenings. This is just a personal teeny tiny example of the discussion coming up between Michael Sandel and Pratap Bhanu Mehta on Mr. Sandel's book, The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good. The book is available on our website, datalitlive.in. There will be a question and answer session at the end, so please do send in your queries and which city you live in. Michael Sandel is, well, Michael Sandel, described as the most relevant living philosopher and a rock star moralist. He teaches political philosophy at Harvard University. His books have been translated into 28 languages and his courses and his TV show have been viewed by millions across the world. Pratap Bhanu Mehta is a noted author, columnist, professor at Ashoka University, and a political scientist. Over to you, Mr. Mehta. Thank you, Suruchi. Um, good morning, Michael. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be able to talk to you. And just on a personal note, there's one thing I'd like to share with our audience that Michael is not just a rock star political philosopher and one of the greatest teachers of the subject. Looking back on his work, one of the things that really stands out and that makes him distinctive is his ability to read the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, as it were. Uh, he was one of the first political philosophers to warn us about the water, moral void in politics and its consequences for democracy. Uh, before it was fashionable to do so, he warned us about the fact that our societies were becoming market societies. We weren't just living in market economies. Um, he was one of the first theorists to think about the effects of biotechnology on our conceptions of the self. And now he's hit the zeitgeist again, in some sense, in a really profound and fascinating way in his new book, The Tyranny of Merit which does not just look at philosophical arguments about what is merit, what is a meritocracy, but really is one of the finest reflections on the nature of our times. So thank you, Michael. And as always, we are in awe of what you have produced. So let me begin with a very simple question. And I think particularly for the young people watching this, um, uh, this time of year, uh, it's been delayed this year in India because of the pandemic. Hundreds of thousands of young people compete for admissions to selective institutions. Um, you teach at the, one of the institutions that's probably one of the most selective in the world. Uh, I teach at such an institution. Indian Institutes of Technology pride themselves on their selectivity. And part of the self-definition of our institutions is that we claim we are trying to select the best. Right? some exceptions here and there for athletes, occasional quotas, but broadly we try and say we are trying to select the best. Can you tell these young people why this particular way of organizing our selection process uh, is harmful for them, perhaps our institutions, um, and for society at large? I mean, let's, let's begin with the experience of an 18-year-old entering this world. Um, and, you know, why the pathways that we have laid out to them uh, actually are so morally mutilating uh, in perhaps ways we had not thought about. Well, thank you, Pratap. And let me say, first of all, a thank you to Saruchi and to say what an honor and privilege it is for me to be in conversation with, with you, Pratap whose work and thinking I so admire, as well as the role you play in interpreting India and the world um, to all of us, really. I've learned a tremendous amount. So 
thank you for joining uh, me in this conversation. You ask about the perspective of an 18 year old in the midst of the sometimes frenzied application process to selective colleges and universities. And it does seem to me that there is something destructive about this. <clears throat> now, in many ways, the meritocratic competition that we've created is inspiring. It's inspiring because it says, if we could someday make chances equal, truly fair, then the winners, those who succeed, will have earned their place, will be able to feel the satisfaction that goes with having earned in a fair competition access to the best university or in the broader economy, the rewards that society bestows on the successful. And there is something inspiring in the project of trying to remove barriers so that everyone has a chance to compete in a fair meritocracy. That's the inspiring side of meritocracy. But there's also an invidious side. To go back to the 18 year old Pratap. Young people today, I think, are subject to pressures for achievement as never before. And I see it starting at quite an early age. And these pressures, which are often conveyed by parents as well as teachers and the wider society, these pressures can deform, even corrupt the way young people grow up, live their lives, and think about learning. Because what we've done is we've turned higher education into a sorting machine for a meritocratic society. We've turned it into a credentializing institution. And this has ratcheted up the pressure, the intense pressure of those who aspire. And it has damaging effects on those who don't make it, those who are excluded, or th those who don't even enter the competition. We know that, and we'll talk about that, I imagine. The, the deepening inequality that besets our societies, yeah. and the anger and resentment to which this gives rise. But even before we get to that damaging effect, consider the effect on the winners of the meritocratic tournament. Those who win admission to the kinds of places where we teach, you and I, Pratap, are marked by this stress-strewn meritocratic gauntlet in ways that are difficult to shake off once they've arrived at university. The habit of hoop jumping and therefore of instrumentalizing learning, inquiry, the pursuit of knowledge, those habits are hard to shake off. And so my worry, apart from the mental health challenges that many young people feel by the time they arrive at selective universities, and these are considerable, but even beyond that, I think that the that converting higher education into a vast sorting machine is not only damaging on those it excludes, it's also damaging on those who we consider the winners because it distracts them and it distracts us from the intrinsic values of education. That's my worry, Pratap. Uh, no, that's, that's very put, well put and I, I, I share those worries. So let me ask you about two innovative proposals you make in the book to address these worries, and then we'll come to the larger sociology and politics of it. One at the institutional level, um, you have a rather interesting proposal about how 
institutions might think of doing admissions differently than they do currently. Right. Um, can you just tell us a bit uh, about that? And the second question I want to sort of add on, which is that uh, is part of the challenge here, not just that we have these seemingly meritocratic admissions procedures that lock students into this debilitating competition. It is also that we have created such a hierarchy of different kinds of institutions right. that people think that the cost of getting into some or failing to get into some institutions is uh, socially unacceptable for them. Right. And if that is the case, don't we also need to think about the ways in which, in a sense, we can equalize the disparities between different kinds of institutions? Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll cut, let me take the second part of your question first about the hierarchy of prestige that we have created in higher education. Now, from one point of view, some might say, well, there should be a steep hierarchy of prestige if we want to encourage and honor and reward excellence. But I think there is something damaging in creating a steep hierarchy of educational institutions as settings of learning, because I think it's at odds fundamentally with a democratic society and with a good society. In we put enormous e emphasis on higher education as the avenue to success. We've cast universities as the arbiters of opportunity in market-driven meritocratic societies. And this, I think, has a disparaging effect on those who don't, uh, don't get a university diploma. We've spoken about some of the damaging effects on those who do get in. It has a damaging effect on those who don't we easily forget when we valorize individual upward mobility through higher education as the solution to inequality, we easily forget that most people in our societies don't have a university degree. In the US, for example, nearly two thirds of adults do not have a four year university degree. The figures are similar. In Britain and Europe, and you will know better than, than me what the figures are in India. So I think it's folly to create an economy that sets as a condition of dignified work and a decent life, a university diploma that most people don't have. And, and the, the effect is to disparage, to fail to respect the contributions that most people make to the economy and to the common good through the work they do, the families they raise, and the communities they serve. So I think we woefully underinvest in those forms of learning on which most people depend. In the U.S. setting, that would mean state colleges, two-year community colleges, vocational and technical training. Not only do we underinvest financially, but we fail to accord the honor and esteem and recognition that those forms of learning and the forms of work to which they're connected deserve. So I think this steep hierarchy of prestige that we've created in higher education is uh, is corrosive of democratic life and of a good society. But I should come now to the other part of your question, which is my, my somewhat provocative admissions proposal. Many selective universities receive far more applicants and well-qualified applicants than they have places. Harvard and Stanford get more than 40,000 applicants for fewer than 2,000 places. So my proposal 
is, and most of them, or a great many of them, are very well qualified. My proposal is to sort out, to call out those who are not qualified to do the work and to do it well and to flourish in these places. And then among the rest, the 15 or 20 or 25,000 that remain, to do a lottery, a lottery of the qualified, I call it. And there are two reasons for this. First, I think it's hubris on our part. I mean, our, I mean, the admissions committees of these places to think that it's possible to predict with any confidence who at the age of 18 will turn out to be a leader of the society or a great scientist or a scholar. Now, it may be true in certain fields like math where one can predict from an early age. But in most fields of human endeavor, including leadership for pluralist societies, I think it's folly to think that we can make these fine-grained predictions effectively. That's one reason. But there's another even more important reason for my lottery proposal, and that is the moral teaching that it conveys. It makes vivid, it makes evident what is in any case true, that admission to selective colleges and universities is not only or mainly the doing of those who succeed. There's a tendency of the successful to forget, for us to forget the luck and good fortune that helped us on our way, the contingencies beyond our control that are inescapable ingredients of of winning, of succeeding in competitive societies. So the lottery proposal is designed to deflate to some degree the meritocratic hubris that our current uh, systems of admission promote. To remind the students, those who are admitted and those who do not win admission of the element of luck and also perhaps to remind their parents, which might go some modest way toward ratcheting down the intense pressures, but also the self-understanding, the hubristic self-understandings that attend the current frenzied system of application and competition. Do, do, do you find that tempting, Pratap, or no, what do you think? No, no, I'm, I'm actually persuasive. In fact, I had sort of not as eloquently proposed uh, this in a column many years ago, and uh, not only were there no takers, uh, people thought I was out of the pale of moral reasoning um, uh, altogether. But 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 maybe that's a segue into a kind of important and, and in a sense much larger point, right? Which is, and, and since you reflect in the history of thought and the history of uh, America so deeply, which is. Uh, what is the attraction of this idea that meritocracy seems to evolve, that somehow we as individuals make and remake our own destiny? I mean, there's almost an underlying metaphysical premise of that kind, right? Yes. Both about the plasticity of human nature, so we can educate everybody into everything uh, right. uh, uh, at, 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 you know, at, 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 at one level. Uh, when and why did that deep idea becomes so attractive because I, I'm quite persuaded by you that actually as a, as a, as a, as a form of life, um, it's not only false, it's, it's quite absurd. But the moral hold of that idea is quite powerful in us. It is very powerful. It is very powerful. And the deep idea that you've identified, I think, really does go to the heart of the allure of the meritocratic idea. The, on the surface, the appeal of meritocracy is to get good people in, in the right positions for, the, for u- good utilitarian reasons. They'll do a better job in a particular social role in governing, in admission to a college. But there's a deeper allure, which you've identified, which is the idea, the conception of the person as ultimately self-made and self-sufficient, that 
if we if if we can compete against fair conditions, fair background conditions, if everyone can start the race at the same same starting point, then the winners will have deserved their winnings. In every society I'm familiar with, those who succeed, whether in material terms or in terms of power and honor and prestige, those who land on top want not only to enjoy the benefits, the rewards associated with winning, they also want something else. They want to believe that they deserve it. They want to believe that. And the meritocratic ideal offers an answer to this this perpetual desire of the successful. It says, provided conditions are fair or more or less fair or on the way to becoming fair, then you've earned it. Your success is your own doing the measure of your merit and by implication those who fall short have no one to blame but from but themselves so it's it's not only the moral self-satisfaction that comes from believing that one has earned and therefore deserves one's winnings and success there is also this even deeper idea of human agency as human freedom is consisting in the idea of being the author of our achievements and of our success. Now, so this is the allure. I think that idea that we are self-made and self-sufficient, that we are the authors of our success is flawed. I think it's mistaken. I think it's misguided. And much of the what inspires and animates the new book, The Tyranny of Merit, is to resist that deep idea. But you have put your finger on it, Pratap. This, I think, is the deep underlying idea. So, so, so let me build on that and sort of maybe draw you a little bit more out on the egalitarian implications of your argument. Um, right. So there'll be our conservative friends on the right, many of our colleagues, uh, I think you could, you could recognize them, who will say something like the following. Look, human beings have a propensity to want to distinguish themselves from others. Uh, In traditional societies, they distinguish themselves based on birth, birthright, genetics. Uh, Sometimes they distinguish themselves on strength, brute power, valor, sometimes on wealth and money. And we replaced all of that with distinguishing ourselves on the basis of talent, something like that. Right. And given that that propensity to distinguish ourselves is so deep. Uh, What alternative would you propose um, by way of thinking about ways in which human beings can distinguish themselves? Uh, They have the self-satisfaction that, yes, there is some achievement at least, uh, which is their doing, but which does not have the kind of hierarchical and deforming implications that meritocracy does. Uh, Because on the other side, the worry is is in some senses that uh, we might get enveloped by a kind of egalitarianism that is so deeply suspicious of any attempts to distinguish ourselves and claim it as an achievement of some kind, um, that you could get a different kind of egalitarian conformity. Right, right. Oh, well, this is such an important question. Let's begin with the egalitarianism. And, and varieties of egalitarianism. The version of egalitarianism most influential today, and that is deeply connected to the meritocratic ideal we've been discussing, Pratap, is equality of opportunity. And according to this idea, if only we could remove barriers to achievement, and those prejudices that hold people back, if only we could do that, then we would have true equality of opportunity and a just society. And in virtue of that, those who succeeded by dint of their talents or their efforts and talents 
would be able to say to themselves, I earned it. So that's equality of opportunity. And as you're suggesting, many, uh, and, well, let me back up. I think it's a mistake to believe that even a, a society with true equality of opportunity would be a just society or a good society. And the book really tries to explain why that's so. But you mentioned uh, uh, critics, yeah. likely critics, who will say yeah. the only alternative to equality of opportunity is a, a stultifying conformist equality of results where everyone must have the same income, the same wealth, the same recognition. And what then becomes, as you were posing the question, Pratap, what comes of the human desire for, for distinction? I don't think the only alternative to equality of opportunity is the stultifying equality of result that the critics point to. I offer a third alternative, which, is, which I call equality of condition, by which I mean a broad democratic equality of condition, not one in which everyone must have the same income and wealth, but in which uh, learning and access to learning, including humane learning, the liberal arts, is diffused throughout the society rather than concentrated in the citadel of higher education. And where, as a result, everyone, people from all walks of life, whatever work they do, have access to the richness of learning, democratic learning, humane learning, and therefore can look one another in the eye, hold their heads up high, and consider themselves as as equals, as equal citizens. So this is the broad democratic equality of condition that I think matters. But it it there is still the question you raise of the the drive for distinction. And here I would say the drive for distinction is a slightly misdirected version of a legitimate and important desire, which is the, the desire for recognition. And part of what I think we've lost, especially in recent decades, as inequality has deepened and as the successful, as elites, uh, tend to look down on those who don't have a university education. The dignity of work has been eroded. It's true we've had stagnant wages and job losses in many countries due to globalization, but it's more than that. I think what, what many working people find galling beyond stagnant wages and diminished economic prospects is that the work they do is no longer respected. It's not a source of esteem and recognition. I think the fundamental human need is the need not for distinction as such, but the need to be needed and to be recognized by one's fellow citizens when one exercises effort or talent to meet those needs. So I would recast or redirect what you've rightly described as what some see as the human aspiration to distinction, to a desire for mutual recognition, which is undermined by the market-driven meritocratic social arrangements that we have created and that have deepened their hold, especially in the past four decades, when globalization has not only deepened inequalities, but has, but we've We've seen changing attitudes toward success, toward winning and losing at the same time that have led to the, this sense among many people that elites, credentialed elites, well-educated elites, look down on them. So, so recognition, yes, I, th I think that the, 
the drive for distinction is a somewhat misdirected version of a legitimate and necessary human aspiration for mutual recognition. Do you, do you find that plausible, Pratap? No, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to that. And actually, I think you've put it, I think, more clearly than anybody since Rousseau had, which is the distinction between drive to recognition that takes a pathological form because of a background condition of uh, uh, inequality and a legitimate uh, need for recognition. Um, I think what's also very powerful about your work, Michael, is, is, is the way you constantly bring it back to the idea of mutuality. That uh, in some senses, the key here is what is the framework for common good and mutual recognition, not mm -hmm. in some senses, just individual recognition and, and, and distinctiveness. So, um, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's absolutely wonderful. Um, let me sort of perhaps move this conversation a little bit in the direction of the political implications of your argument. Um, and uh, as always, Michael, you were very prescient, I think, in uh, diagnosing even before people were talking about it, uh, the kinds of backlash that you would expect to see in a democracy where credentialism uh, a pathological drive for recognition, uh, background material conditions of inequality take hold in the way that uh, they have. And I think what your book makes quite vivid is that there is something particularly humiliating about credentialism in a way in which is not even the case with just inequality of wealth, because at least that's, that's in a sense an outward characteristic. Um, whereas once a society comes in the grip of credentialism, uh, the idea that it is your fault in some ways yeah. Yeah. Uh, that you are left behind. Um, uh, and, and, and because there is no space for recognizing the legitimacy of certain kinds of work, uh, there is a backlash against elites. So my question is this one, how much of the, ba the populist backlash that you see around the world or specifically Trumpism uh, can be attributed to, uh, in some sense, this uh, this ideology. But perhaps from a long-term point of view, uh, did this transition come about simply because there was a shift in our conception of ideas? Or is there an underlying transformation in the economy? So in the US, one can think of, for example, the, the decline of manufacturing and its sort of relegation to the margins in some sense of the economy. Um, and therefore, the decline of points of sociability like unions in some senses, which in small pockets at least provided those pockets of esteem. Uh, so how much of it is a shift in ideas and how much of it is a much deeper structural shift that we still haven't quite come to grips with, you know, how we orient ourselves to this new kind of economy. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot there in, in that cluster of questions, Pratap. So let me begin with the last uh, part first. I think you're right that not only have attitudes towards success changed and toward merit, which I emphasized, but this has happened against the background of changes in the economy, which have abetted these changes in attitudes. And I think there's a reciprocal relation between the changing attitudes and ideas of, towards success and the changing shape of the economy. We've shifted, especially in the last four decades, from an economy where work and rewards were mostly about making things and providing useful services to people in a tangible way toward managing money, for example, with the financialization of the economy that's taken place, especially in advanced economies over the past four decades, the role of finance as a share of GDP and of corporate profits has grown dramatically over the past, well, half century. And this carries subtle consequences for the way we value 
traditional forms of work, which involve, you mentioned manufacturing, Pratap, making things, making tangible things that people buy and use and need. Well, they need some of them, not, not others. But making things or providing services, healing the sick, teaching the young, services whose whose connection to the common good is self-evident toward a kind of abstract form of work. Some people call it knowledge work, broadly speaking, whose connection to the common good is in many cases debatable. At best, it's abstract and contestable, especially when we, when we get into the domains of speculative finance, for example, that are increasingly remote from investing in actual companies, factories, roads, hospitals, schools, homes, and have more to do with various bets on the future prices of commodities, for example, or of real estate, or of synthetically designed derivative investments. But increasingly, these are the economic roles in the so-called knowledge economy that are not only rewarded most lavishly, but honored. And so this change in the economy, I think, is bound up with the changes in attitudes and values that I emphasize in the book. And one reinforces the other until we reach a point where those who perform work in the traditional sense feel that the work they do is no longer respected. It's no longer a source of social recognition and esteem. And this leads to resentment and anger, legitimate much of it, anger and resentment, against credentialed elites in the so-called knowledge economy who reap enormous rewards even though their contribution to the common good in some cases is debatable and contestable and attenuated at best. This leads, when coupled with the meritocratic ethic that celebrates the successful for their talent and for their success, it leads to a politics of grievance and humiliation, which is a more volatile toxic kind of politics than a politics that simply says the system is rigged, the distribution of rewards is unfair, we want to change that distribution. The politics of distribution is tame by comparison to the politics of humiliation and resentment. And this, I think, is why we've seen the intensity of the populist backlash against elites around the world a reach for meaning and purpose and identity and recognition against the background of a political economy where, where work is no longer a source of recognition and social esteem in the way it once was, and where national identity no longer seems an arena of recognition and identity in, an, in a globalizing economy that observes fewer and fewer of the boundaries that nations once represented. So I think the politics of humiliation is the result of these developments, both in the economy, I agree with you, and in attitudes and ideas that have fed the populist backlash. So, so Michael, before we bring in the audience, um, we will hopefully have a new administration come into power in the US in January. Yeah. Um, and given the philosophical consensus that is now emerging largely to, due to the force of your writings about the kind of incoherence um, uh, um, uh, uh, of the idea of meritocracy, uh, what are a couple of policy changes you would request President Biden to think about that could, in a sense, shake us out of the current equilibrium that we are trapped in, ideological equilibrium and economic equilibrium, and something that particularly addresses shaking off the hold of meritocracy, 
um, and emancipating us from this politics of humiliation that we are subject to. Any favorite so, proposals? Okay, let me try, try out one or two proposals. But first, I, I do not, despite your, your ge the generous premise of your question, I do not want to yes. overstate or presuppose that my critique of meritocracy has reached the ears or influenced the policies of the Democratic Party. Uh, Biden, uh, thankfully, uh, won the election and defeated Trump and will take office despite, despite Trump's shenanigans. But I think Biden's mission and purpose in that, by extension, of the Democratic Party remains a work in progress. And in some ways, during the campaign, Biden did depart from the rhetoric of rising, right. the meritocratic frame that had animated previous Democratic presidential candidates and presidents mm -hmm. from Bill Clinton to Barack Obama to Hillary Clinton and various other nominees. It's interesting, as a side note, Biden was the first Democratic nominee for president in 36 years without an Ivy League degree. To some extent, this enabled him just intuitively to connect a little bit more successfully with blue collar workers, working class voters than his predecessors. It remains the case that overwhelmingly White voters without a college degree voted for Trump in this election as they did last time. So the Democratic Party has a long way to go toward connecting with the working class voters who once constituted its base. As for policy suggestions of ways that Biden and the Democratic Party might redirect the terms of public discourse, broadly, I think they should focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition, focus less on the rhetoric of rising individual mobility through higher education as an answer to inequality, and focus more on the dignity of work as a political theme, more on making life better for people who make important contributions to their work, whether or not they are well credentialed. One proposal we've already discussed glancingly, yeah. which is to invest in a more serious way in the forms of learning on uh, outside of higher education, state colleges, two-year community colleges, vocational and technical training, and to, incord, uh, to accord those forms of learning more honor and respect. The Germans do this better than, than we do, for example. It doesn't have to be such a steep hierarchy of esteem. So that would be one area. Another would deal with structural inequalities directly, rather than simply saying, well, you can bypass them, maybe, if you get a degree, and then maybe you can, can rise. I would address those inequalities directly. Uh, the tax system could be one way. For example, I think we should have a public debate cast in terms of the dignity of work about why we should tax earnings from labor at a higher rate than we tax earnings from dividends and capital gains. Why do we do that? And what does that say about what we really think about the dignity of work? That would be a second proposal. Here's a third, also to do with tax, but tax from the standpoint of its moral teaching, its expressive significance. We in the U.S. fund Social Security through a payroll tax, which is a tax on labor paid by workers and their employers. I would say, why don't we swap out the payroll tax and shift, make up the lost revenue through a tax on financial transactions, which would bear most heavily on those speculative forms of financial activity, high frequency trading, in such things that are lavishly rewarded, but that have at best an attenuated connection to the common good, to the real economy. I would make this tax proposal not mainly from the standpoint of redistribution from the rich to the poor, though that might be a desirable feature of it, 
but as a way of trying to frame the debate about what counts, what really counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. Is it speculative finance or is it the kind of work done by not only teachers and healthcare providers, but by those, those upon whom we rely increasingly during this pandemic. The people we're now calling essential workers, which include warehouse workers and delivery workers and truck drivers and home health care providers and, and child care workers. So I would use these proposals, these concrete proposals, for example, about shifting taxation as a way of prompting this broader debate about what it means to renew the dignity of work. So th that's really terrific, Michael. So um, the audience is sending in lots of questions. We'll probably have time only for um, three or four. So let me pick up one question which um, Mukundan Alexander has sent in. And it's a slightly mischievous question, but an interesting one. What if someone asserts something like, I recognize I'm not self-made, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I have an equal obligation to the less fortunate. So uh, what would one say to such a person uh, uh, that even if one overturns the assumption, the arrogance of saying I'm self-made, it right. doesn't necessarily follow that I might actually care for the equal recognition of others. I might just say it's luck. Right. Well, uh, Alexander, you might say it, it's luck, but acknowledging the role of luck in life and in the benefits we reap by exercising our talents is a first step on the way to a politics of the common good. Here's why, Alexander. I agree with you that it doesn't get us all the way. Because even if we acknowledge that, our, that the talents and gifts that enable us to, be, to succeed and to reap rewards are not our own doing, it's a further question. Mm -hmm. To whom or to what are we indebted for those talents and for those gifts? And I would add, for the fact that they happen to be not only nurtured by this society, but also rewarded by it. These are other elements of luck. And reflecting on the sources of luck, I would say to Alexander, leads to reflection on indebtedness, on sources, uh, th those who have contributed to success, from parents and teachers, to communities, to countries, to the times in which we live. So acknowledging the role of luck in life, in having the talent society happens to prize, to nurture and reward, prompts a broader reflection about indebtedness. And once we find ourselves engaging in the reflecting on our indebtedness, we're not far, Alexander, you should brace yourself for this possibility, we're not far from a debate about the common good and a debate about what we owe one another as members of a community or as fellow citizens. That I think is the, is the connection. Great. So I'm combining two questions on education, Michael. Um, uh, one is from um, Suchitra Rai um, and one from somebody who goes by the name chemical engineer. I assume that's a pseudonym. Um, so broadly, they're asking, would you be in favor of free public higher education as they have in Germany? Um, and in India, in our new education policy, there's a particular emphasis, at least on paper, being put on promoting vocational education, uh, which is, I think, also inspired by the German model in some ways, uh, Germany. Uh, um, any thoughts on both of those proposals? Um, free higher education is a way of equalizing conditions. Yes, my answer to both would be yes. Free public higher education and 
strengthened and publicly supported the vocational education. I think these are two uh, vehicles for uh, renewing the dignity of work, of making for a more just society, of broadening access, but not only broadening access for reasons of fairness, also creating the conditions where in virtue of educational opportunities, everyone, regardless of their background, can participate in the world of work and in the, and in the life of democratic citizenship in a way that equips them to, to win the mutual recognition that we were discussing earlier. So I'm very much in favor of both of these proposals. And in some ways, the both will have to go together because if you don't have, uh, if you don't dignify vocational education, what you then do is by free education simply overproduce a particular kind of elite uh, in some yeah. ways. So, so I, I, I think yes, the two will have to be complementary to each other. Uh, I agree. Uh, there, there's a there's a question by Kanak uh, Goshalkar about the relationship between meritocracy and liberalism. Um, how do you see liberalism being affected by this merit issue? And I think the underlying premise of the question seems to be that, um, at least on Kanak's reading, uh, liberalism has historically been closely associated with meritocracy, although I, I, I should add, I think as a historical footnote, as you point out in your book, uh, both Rawls and Hayek, in their own right. ways, not as radical as you, were critics of the idea of meritocracy. Uh, they were. But, but do you see that there is a kind of historically been an elective affinity between the way liberalism has been interpreted as a dominant public philosophy over the last 30, 40 years in meritocracy? Yes, broadly speaking, I would say they're, they are connected. There is a certain affinity, though it's a complicated story, not least because there are varieties of liberalism and uh, Pratap has written powerfully about this. And so depending on the version of liberalism, there is a, there is a greater or lesser affinity with meritocratic ideas. And uh, 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 Pratap, as you point out in, in the book, I tried to show how both Hayek and Rawls, who seem to represent the poles of contemporary liberal debate, both philosophically mount arguments against meritocracy, at least explicitly, even though features of their view turn out to be compatible with the attitudes towards success that I've described and that I see as contributing to the, the politics of humiliation. But the thread that connects, the philosophical thread that connects the version of meritocracy most prevalent today and the liberal tradition broadly conceived is this. Liberalism, or at least important influential versions of liberalism, want to avoid bringing into public discourse contested conceptions of the good, contested theories of value. Meritocracy, especially a market meritocracy, avoids part of its appeal, and we've not quite discussed this yet, but part of its appeal is that it seems to rely on the market, the labor market, to define what counts as a valuable contribution to the economy. And that provides the basis for, if, if it were a perfectly competitive free market, and if opportunities were truly equal, then according to one version, one prominent version of meritocracy, the market would be the measure of merit and of desert. The assumption is that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. And that we should not intrude in a judgmental way about whether those valuations are right, whether the market verdict gets it right. What I try to argue in the book is that it's a mistaken assumption to think 
that even in a perfectly free market, that the money people make is the measure of their true contribution to the common good. If I'm right about that, then someone might well object, well, what source of value if not the one decided by the market? And to that I say, well, we have to, if the market is verdict can't be relied on to determine who really has contributed value to the common good, we, we have to debate that question ourselves as democratic citizens. What do we value? What should we value? And that means we have to debate the meaning of the good. And that debate is resisted not only by a market meritocracy, it's also resisted by the version of liberalism that says we shouldn't engage in debates about competing conceptions of what's truly valuable, what counts as, an, as, a, as a truly important contribution to the common good. We shouldn't allocate honor and recognition based on judgments of, of that kind because that will lead to disagreement, because that will violate the precepts of liberal public reason and so on. So at that general level, I think there is a connection between a deep assumption of meritocracy and this idea, I think overly confining idea of liberal public reason. So, so, so Michael, that um, uh, we are running out of time, but there's this a wonderfully large question that Raz Hamza has asked, which is, can a compassionate society um, and the kinds of values that you are promulgating, can that actually coexist with a capitalist society? Um, which is that so long as relations of private property and competition remain the main drivers of an economy, um, what chance do these kinds of values have? So the, as always the big capitalism question. Right. Well, the, the short answer to a, a big and important question is, there are varieties of capitalism and whether a politics of the common good of the kind I'm defending in the book um, is compatible with capitalism depends very much on what kind of capitalism um, we design and conceive and defend. I would say a capitalism that is not understood to define through the labor market what counts as value or a valuable contribution to the common good is conceivably compatible with the politics of the common good. But in practice, that would be a capitalism embedded in and constrained by values and norms and democratic institutions that would have the final say, the final word on questions of value and on the meaning of the common good. So properly constrained and confined by, by moral and democratic deliberation, that version of capitalism, if you could still describe it as capitalism, could conceivably be compatible with the politics of the common good. But a capitalism understood to be the primary driver of social and economic relations and rewards and recognition and valuations would not be. Thank you, Michael, so much for, as always, uh, a truly profound and eye-opening conversation. I'm sorry to our viewers that we haven't been able to take in all your questions, uh, but you can have a conversation with Michael through his absolutely wonderful book. I cannot tell you how rich it is. Um, uh, thank you once again, Michael, and I'll turn it over to Suruchi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pratap, for really these wonderfully probing uh, questions. And Saruchi, thank you to you for convening us. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. You know, Sahir's lines were coming to my mind. Insano ki kimat kuch bhi nahi. Insano ki izzat jab jhute sikko mein na toli jayegi, wo subha kabhi to aayegi, wo subha kabhi to aayegi. Yes, did you want to translate those? Uh, no, my maybe. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thought, which is um, the worth of human beings should not, in a sense, be measured by the weight of the coins. 
Uh, and when will that new dawn come when this is not the case? Wow, I love that. I love that. <laughs> Thank you, Surpachi, for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have sessions lined all of tomorrow, which is our last day. So do tune in live wire tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. How the brain learns and remembers. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Tata Group. <laughs>